we have uh, this this motion by uh, more than 100 lower and middle income countries um, because clearly they can't afford it. I mean, that, I mean, just elaborate on that concept. Sure that people in the United States get the concept of like the, the, the country just can't afford to produce these uh, vaccines as the way it uh, the way it is now constructed, our, our vaccine regime. Right. Wouldn't it be, would it be interesting to actually pivot the conversation to why these countries can't afford the vaccine? But notice that need, the fact that they can't afford it, necessitates that they be helped, necessitates a sacrifice, necessitates that their priorities, that they become a priority for those who can afford them. That's because these countries have been plagued um, uh, by capitalism and other. So they've been plagued by capitalism. These countries can't afford them because capitalism has plagued them. Sort of extractive colonial practices. So it's, it's, it's really interesting because this is a history I did not know. It's good that Anne is educating us here. Um, for a long period of time. Uh, uh, didn't you know that before colonialism, let's say what, 1600 or so, um, India, um, I don't know, the, all of Southeast Asia, uh, the Middle East, Africa, Africa. These were all rich, thriving, technologically advanced societies that were then exploited and by the colonials who extracted all that wealth, who stole all that wealth and became rich over it. And as a consequence of that, all these countries, all these countries, who otherwise could afford a vaccine because they used to be once upon a time rich, now cannot afford a vaccine because of the exploitation by the capitalists. Huh. If I remember my history right, Africa, Southeast Asia, India have always been poor. I mean, China, the exception of China, which has often been richer than the, than the West, but even that over the last few hundred years has not been true. But certainly, if you go back to 1200, 1300, 1400, there were periods where Islam, the Muslim world, was richer than the West, but that's a long time ago as well. But since then, not because of the West, but because of their own actions, these countries became a lot poorer than the West. Colonialism, which did a lot of evil, a lot of harm, a lot of bad, did not make these countries poorer. Indeed, history suggests that they made these countries richer. They taught these countries that they had resources. Before, they were just in the ground, useless. Now, they could actually be extracted and used. Used by whom? By industrial societies. It's only industry, capitalism, that makes resources valuable. Remember, oil used to reduce the value of your land because it was useless. It was a pollutant. It made growing stuff impossible. It's only industrialization that made oil valuable to, for example, sheiks in the Middle East. Right? So no, these countries are not poor because they were exploited or because of capitalism. They're poor because they haven't embraced capitalism. They haven't embraced private property. They haven't embraced the idea of making money, an idea that Ayn Rand articulates and Atlas Shrugged in the money speech, the idea of making money. That idea is, is what changes the world. The idea that making money is good is the idea that makes you rich. And then allowing people the freedom to live up to that idea. That's what makes you rich. Uh, but no, Anne thinks they're poor because they've been exploited. This is, and again, this is one of those lines that the left repeats over and over and over again. Completely detached from reality, completely detached from facts. But they repeat it often enough, it just becomes institutionalized. Everybody thinks it is the reality. These are economies that are not as robust as ours. Um, and that's, of course, relative. Um, and there are countries with populations that um, do not live the kind of lifestyle that we live. Yeah, why? The global south is a very different place. And in part, that is because of the global north and, and our rapacious history. Um, Maybe it's because they observed the global north's um, philosophy. They observed the global north's success. 
And they chose not to emulate it. They chose not to emulate it. That's why they stayed poor. I mean, Argentina, I don't know if you've ever seen this graph of Argentina basically almost having the same GDP per capita as the United States in 1914 at the, uh, at the start of World War I. And since then, the United States way outpacing Argentina, which basically has, 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 has almost not grown its GDP per capita since then. And the, the difference is that Argentina went the populist, authoritarian, uh, socialist route, statist route, and the United States stayed relatively, I emphasize relatively, free. And that made all the difference in terms of wealth creation has nothing to do with the people there. They kept up with the United States through the 19th century and early 20th century. It has nothing to do with uh, their ability. It has nothing to do with natural resources. It has nothing to do, it has everything to do with governance, ideas, sets of beliefs. I, I didn't say Peronism is socialism. It's authoritarianism. Peronism is a form of socialism, but it's, it really is... Uh, you know, a, a form of fascism, which again is a form of socialism, really. It's a form, all of them are forms of statism. All of them are anti capitalist. And so, um, what these countries have been doing, and India in particular, um, after uh, independence, the country said, um, We are establishing laws that favor our people over these colonial paradigms. That's right. India did that uh, after it achieved its independence, and stayed dirt poor. And indeed, for decades, there was this massive frustration that we were now free of our colonial, quote, colonial masters. Uh, the British had left, they'd left us alone, and here we are, we continue to be dirt poor. And it's only in the last 30 or so years that India has come out of that poverty, started coming out of that poverty, and that it correlates completely with liberalization, with opening up, with uh, institutions, instituting some of that global north's ideas about uh, private property, about uh, capital movement, about trade, about capitalism. We want drugs to remain affordable. And in the past, companies like Novartis have gone to the Indian courts and said, we do not want any of our drugs to be um, uh, generics. We don't want Indian manufacturers to reverse engineer them and make them affordable to more people. And uh, they have continued to lose because the Indian Supreme Court has, um, has held its line. So in India, they make uh, illegal, although less and less so, but they make illegal um, generics of drugs developed in the West that are under copyright, uh, under patent in the West. But what's interesting is that India has no biotech industry. It has no, uh, you know, uh, R&D into original. I mean, a lot of the uh, generics that are developed in India are developed by, uh, by the largest generic manufacturer in the world, which is an Israeli company called Teva. So uh, India, unfortunately, in the, in the biotech field, in, in the pharmaceutical field, is a copier. It has no original research. And as long as they don't respect property rights, as long as they don't respect patents, they won't develop original drugs. They'll just be copiers. But not a lot of countries have that kind of um, toughness when it comes to resisting American imperialism and power. And so American imperialism means protecting uh, property rights, protecting patents. That is imperialism. And, and so they're, they're left at the moment, and, and I know that we can get into the current structure, but they're left at the moment to kind of beg um, for, for drugs that indeed, when, they, when India... When, when countries can't get enough vaccines, we all suffer because the longer, this, um, the longer this pandemic goes on, the more chance there are of uh, uh, strains developing and that, um, that virus coming back to us. So that's kind of the self-interested argument. We should help all of them because um, new strains are going to develop in these other countries and it's going to come back to us to bite us. Maybe... Maybe by then Moderna and Pfizer and these other companies will have given us booster shots to cover the different iterations of the viruses. Maybe. But does that mean that we should stop vaccinating ourselves and give the drugs to these other countries? Does it mean that we should give up intellectual property rights, the patent system, the system that made us rich 
in order to give these drugs to anybody who wants to make them. Notice that even if he did that, we had Adam Ossoff on the show a week or so ago, and, and he talked about this. Even if we did that, even if we did away with the patent system tomorrow, they still couldn't produce these. These are very, 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 very difficult drugs to produce, to store, and to ultimately administer. But all of that is ignored. I mean, again, you saw this with the debate with Vosh yesterday. Production is simple. Creating drugs is simple. Creating vaccines is simple. Distributing vaccines is simple. You just have to get the capitalists out of the way. And all this just happens. They have no conception of what it takes to produce, or what it takes to have a supply chain, what it takes to distribute, what it takes from an idea to a shot in the arm, what that process takes. Just no conception of that reality. They think that products just show up as magic. What, what kinds of, what are the countries that come to mind that are experiencing um, outside of, we're talking about India's COVID surge, but that are bearing the brunt of not really having, I guess, the court infrastructure that, um, that India does in order to, to uh, push back against the power of these manufacturers? There aren't many that can. I mean, the larger countries with bigger populations, but it's really, um, these companies exist in the global north. And as we've seen, they've been protected by their home countries. I mean, the entire Operation Warp Speed was kind of a raining of resources, like $10 billion down on six individual companies. Um, and, you know, um, even uh, the Pfizer um, drug that was developed with BioNTech, Tech, a, a German company, they received 444, $445 million from the German government. So we're, this is like a global north um, monopolization of this resource that is necessary. Monopolization of a resource. So notice this. This, this is what's interesting, and this is really important because it relates again to the Vosh debate, and it relates again to the whole way in which, um, in which leftists think about the world. A vaccine that was developed by scientists, then engineered, produced, tested, are complex, difficult tasks that require real innovation, real ingenuity, real productive ability. To them, it's a resource. It's like, it's like coal. It's like... I don't know, just sand. It's just there to be picked up. And the global north, talk about racism, but the global north has monopolized the resource. They, they cornered all the sand. No. These vaccines were developed by companies that happen to be in the north, that happen to be, and the north here represents free countries. The global north represents freedom. So here are countries that developed these drugs. They're protected by a system of property rights, which made the north rich. They're, developed by, they're, they're protected by the fact that they are free, which is what made the north rich, which she's choosing to evade. But it's just a resource. The vaccine is just a resource that needs to be allocated. And people need it in the poor countries and therefore should be taken from the global north and given to them. Taken from free people and given to unfree people. Why? Because they're unfree. Why? Because they're suffering. Why? Because they're poor and therefore they should be sacrificed too. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, 
please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now. Uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.